food halls, the breeding ground for corporate lunches and pretentious family outings. Well, you're probably wondering what the hell I'm doing here at Atlanta's most famous food hall upon City Market. With low self-worth, I too sometimes like to enjoy a craft brew. But let's get real. It seems like these places are popping up everywhere and are becoming more popular than ever. Since 2015, the number of food halls across the U.S. has skyrocketed from a mere 50 food halls in 2015 to a whopping 400 in 2020. So I've been wondering, why the hell are these establishments so popular? Could these food halls actually be causing more problems than they create? I'm Nathan, and the answers to these questions and more are coming up next. So let's try something new today. So what the hell is a food hall? I'm sure most of you degenerates are very familiar with places like this. But those of you aren't, let me show you. Food halls ain't nothing new. The modern food hall is loosely based on the concept of old world markets, places where locals sold produce, groceries, independently made goods, and dined. But in American cities, this concept is dumbed down to fit in your dingy local high school's cafeteria, your decaying local mall, or even worse, your whitewash company food hall. But today's modern food hall is a different breed. The concept is the same. Bring a bunch of restaurants into one central location or the communal dining area. But the twist? Instead now, they're all local, independently owned small businesses. So in many ways, this concept is great both for small business owners and management. Prices are typically much lower than standard brick and mortar, while offering more flexible lease options and more foot traffic. Sound familiar? It's the modern food truck. Food halls provide a similar startup cost to a food truck versus opening a physical location, without a lot of the downsides of owning a food truck. Shockingly, it costs about five to 10 times less to open a food truck or a business at a food hall versus a standard independent location. Food halls are really disrupting the food truck trend, making it easier than ever before to start up a new small business or allow an existing food truck business to expand into a physical location. So the idea is nice. Bring together a bunch of local businesses and create a community space for them. And in a lot of ways, they do that. The food hall is a natural progression of the classic American mall. America, car dependent suburbia, lacked true third places in their environments. And the mall was designed to fill this void, providing entertainment, shopping, dining, and more in a communal space. So while malls were envisioned originally to be mixed-use places, featuring housing and dining, they unfortunately ended up being commercialized into just retail spaces for the most part. Today, online shopping has practically killed the modern commercial mall, leaving the American mall a liminal place in today's culture. So food halls aim to reattract this audience that was lost to online shopping. Since then, they've successfully made the food court attractive to the general population by focusing on what online shopping can't provide, hospitality using unique attractors, such as small business or international cuisine. But in itself, this is the problem. Behind me is Sweet Auburn's Municipal Market. It's part of the only existing freestanding farmer's market dating all the way back to 1923. This place is great because it's community organized, it's small business owned, and a nonprofit. It's generally a place that contributes to the city as a whole and the neighborhood it resides in. How? Let's check it out. So this is such a contrast to modern food halls. Farmers markets provide such useful amenities to people that live in the neighborhood and in the city. 
while food holes seem to cater more to people outside the city and outside the neighborhood, almost as if a tourist attraction. So this might be fine in suburbia, where the mall model was born and still exists to this day, but in cities, this can pose some problems. See, let's look at Edgewood Avenue. It's starting to feel like every business we love and cherish is starting to disappear by the minute. Once Sweet Auburn's busiest Black Main Street, and more recently, a more popping nightlife district, Edgewood Avenue these days hasn't been faring as hot. Just at the end of last year, we saw many closures just along this street, including Noni's, Bigger Staff Brewing Company, Georgia Beard Garden, Matza's Pizza, just to name a few. See, the Beltline runs through Edgewood Avenue right here, tapping away foot traffic from the street onto the Beltline, the ever-growing Frog Street Market, opened in 2014. So I don't think this is a coincidence. The Beltline has driven up property values in this area ever since the Frog Street Market opened, and why would anyone leave the pedestrian environment of the Beltline to walk on Edgewood Ave? So all this really represents a larger symptom in the overall entrepreneurial landscape. The success of food halls represents a critical problem happening in our cities, the increasing difficulty to operate out of traditional real estate. Inherently, is all this a bad thing? On one hand, these places are bringing new levels of density that we haven't seen before. But on the other hand, places like Frog Street District are zapping foot traffic from its surrounding neighborhoods and making it much harder for businesses to stay afloat. Edgewood Avenue into downtown is a ghost town and just does not get the same amount of attention and foot traffic as at Crock Street Market and the Beltline. But I do think it's worth realizing that these places don't operate in a vacuum. Pond City Market in particular is infamous for not being adequately taxed for its property taxes. Yes, you heard that right. Jamestown's operation here has had its property tax values frozen at 2014 levels all the way up until 2020. Wow, the property's valuation rose to up to a billion dollars. Like, it's a ridiculous number. The property is only paying about $250,000 a year, when it should be paying nearly close to $20 million. And still, despite Jamestown's $11 billion valuation, they continue to make appeals to property tax increases year by year. So while I understand wanting to encourage development within the city's limits, it doesn't make any sense to subsidize such immensely successful places such as Pond City Market. This is money that pays for our public schools, for our infrastructure, and so much more. So for such a pro-business state such as Georgia, it really makes you wonder why the state doesn't subsidize actual small business. We have got to start asking, who are these places for? So that's it for this video. Thank you ever for watching. I know I did this one a little bit differently, but I'm trying to keep it from not getting too stale. If you like this one, please check out another one. It'll pop up somewhere up here. And uh, thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Peace.